Hi, Bob. <laughs> How you doing there, Steve? Good to see you, man. Good to see you, man. It's been a long time. I was trying to remember how long it's been, but I can't even. It's I been a while. The last time we met was with John Bush and maybe Joey Vera. Or no, I think it was when he was in Anthrax. So I think it was him and maybe Charlie Benante. That's quite uh, possible. <laughs> yeah, in L.A. We went to some bar in L.A. So we're talking, this must have been like 94 or something. Yeah, that is possible. I did hang yeah. around a lot with Bush when he was in Anthrax because they, whenever he was in, I had moved to New York and then Boston when I was right. working for a and Records. So whenever they came through town, I hung out with Bush and Joey used to hang, we hung out a lot when I was in L.A. when I was living in Encino. Now, are you still living in L.A.? No, I'm actually in uh, uh, San Jose at the moment. So San Jose. Yeah, which wow. kind of brought me here. You know, I'm kind of a drifter, you know, being the single man that I am. And just kind of, you know, I kind of I got here when, when I started the uh, Bay Area Godfathers documentary. You know, I was actually living in Sacramento. I just had to get out of L.A. And I liked it out there. And, uh, you know, I was coming back and forth to are going a lot to the Bay Area to do all the interviews. And uh, my camera guy had a place in San Jose. He said, dude, I could get it to you cheaper than what you're paying in Sacramento. And I'm like, for San Jose, you can, because San Jose is ridiculously expensive. You know, the whole Really, Bay it is? Oh, so the Bay Area, I think it's the most expensive place to live in, in, in the States, more expensive than Hawaii or New York these days. So, so you had to- a good deal. And uh, so I've been here ever since, so. Did you like ride out the whole pandemic up there in San Jose? Pretty much, pretty much. I, mean, I go down to LA quite a bit. I still, you know, my mom's still down in Huntington Beach and, you know, where I grew up. And, I, I right thought on. you were from Orange County. Yeah, I had. Yeah, to, Orange I had County. Now, yeah. correct me if I'm wrong here. Didn't we meet through the band Eden? Is that how we met? Yes, you were at Restless at the time. Yeah, I think. Enigma. Uh, yeah, yeah. Now, you know, I just did a, a, a podcast for... Um, uh, Temple of Blair, regard the Roadrunner day. I did one of those. <laughs> he told me that he was telling, talk about you, and I was kind of trying to think. I go, yeah, yeah, Steve, were you at Roadrunner prior to Enigma or just after? After, Enigma? after. Okay, so because yeah. it was right when Roadrunner formed, right? You ran the yeah, I, with Holly. Holly, Holly Lane, and I opened the office in New York. She actually That's opened right. it, and I was the second employee. And okay. we worked together there, but I didn't last very long at Roadrunner, like less than a year. I, I Case Wessels and I didn't always see eye to eye on everything. Yeah, but. I was there for a little over a year, too. When I got there, you know, obviously after Monty and when it got established, I started the L.A. office, you might remember, in 91, I think. And I was there for about a year as well in LA. Uh, but yeah, tough time, company to so. work for, man. Tough yeah, company yeah. to work for. Yeah, um, it was at the time, yeah. <laughs> how did you get started in the music business? Because I know about all your document, the Inside Metal documentaries. I'm going to talk about that because my voice appears in a couple of those. But yeah, how did you actually get started? What What are your roots? Well, you might remember the fanzine I did, the Headbanger. Yeah. Um, which, uh, that's how I got in contact with the whole Enigma thing because Green World, Dean and Peter, if you remember the, yes, the I do. world when they were in Torrance, they uh, distributed the Headbanger. Uh, so I had Green World and Important Records, which you know now is you know, Relativity, uh, uh, Sony now, I guess. Uh, but uh, they were like my two big distributors. And I did it just as a fan. It was a Xerox fanzine and I was distributing a few thousand issues uh, at its peak. And um, that kind of got my way into to the, the business. And that's what led me into actually with, with Enigma and Eden. I started working with the, you know, the band August Red Moon broke up and then they uh -huh. reformed as Eden. And, you know, I was, you know, I think 18, 19 at the time when I uh, started, you know, dealing with them. And, and uh, 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 Steve Pross at the label at the time heard the demo and that's how I kind of got into music business. So it was all kind of, you know, it just happened. I never really had any training of sorts, but it was just a fan thing, you know, and the fanzine really led me into, you know, because back then you didn't know. It's like, you know, myself, Brian Slagle, who had the new heavy yeah. metal review and some people up in the Bay Area, Ron Quintana and uh, Bob Maldoni from Kick-Ass Monthly. There was a, you know, this network of fanzine guys. And, you know, and then, of course, Mike Varney was very uh, influential in that shrapnel. whole underground scene, yeah. shrapnel and uh, you know, that's when Enigma came to fruition and Megaforce Records. And 
great times, as you remember, but it was all the beginning of, of that whole independent metal scene, you know? It was-, it was I, I started at a NIG, well, I started in the Green World sales office because it was the same company then January 4th, 1984. So yeah. you must have been right after that. Yeah, well, they were doing my fanzine since 82, 83. Oh, that, oh so you go way back when it was yeah. a real small so, staff. Yeah, yeah. and then- uh, that was when they first started, and I don't remember how I hooked up with them or if they contacted me or, or whatever, but uh, they were they were very small then, and it was Dean and Peter, and I remember they just started handling Jane's addiction, or uh, maybe that was a little bit after. Uh, uh, I, I think I think uh, the the Motley Crew on Leather Records was, was their the first, first big yes. thing, and maybe yes. Great White. Like that's you know, right, because Alan Niven was, was yes working through yes. there, yeah, the, a yeah, Dan records or whatever. The first, so yeah. you were actually were dealing with them before I was. <laughs> I didn't, yeah, I, 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 that was a long Bush. time ago, dude. That's yeah, a long yeah. time ago. I was a kid. I mean, I started the fanzine when I was eighteen, so seventeen, eighteen. So yeah, I was just you know, and I would go there and you know drop off. I you know I would have to fold and staple all the issues myself. You know, I'd have all my friends come over and we'd, you know, I'd get a bunch of beer. We'd come over and have a headbanger folding party as we called it. But it was, you know, it was fun times, man. But it yeah, was that was a great time. time being in the, I was in that Torrance office for, for two years and then we moved to El Segundo. I so I was there for a while. So yeah. I know the building. I remember yeah. Striper actually played in our warehouse when I just had started working there. Well, it, I was here for about a year by that point, and they did our Christmas party, our staff Christmas party with Striper right. in full regalia, you know, doing yeah. their, the Christian metal thing. Um, so you wrote for a long time then, and you managed and you wrote at the same time before you started doing the, because you didn't start doing the documentaries till 2014. So what yeah. did you do for 30 years? Was it well, all writing? I was, uh... You know, I, I wrote for a few different uh, magazines after Headbanger. I was doing, you might remember John Stranansky, of yes. course, Metal Rendezvous. Uh, I did a lot of stuff with him. And that was up until the early 90s, I think. And, you know, I was doing the Foundations Forum and all those. Oh, yeah. I used to time. see you there all the time at Dead Forum. Yeah, we were there every year, man. Definitely. Yeah. And then, you know, as I said, I worked for uh, Roadrunner for about a, a year and a half or so in early 90s and I worked with Herb Cohen's label Bizarre Straight Records for a little while which was which was interesting that was a lot of fun and he did mostly the retro bands and you know they, they were going through Rhino they reissued all the old you know Tom Waits catalog Screaming Jay Hawkins all that kind of stuff and they had a few new artists and that was Armed Forces which was Mike Henry after he left uh Eden, they, they were on that label. So worked there for a bit. And then um, I just started doing, uh, you know, wrote uh, independently for a few different magazines. And I then I got into like podcasting and uh, was doing some stuff with hard radio in the late 90s. Yeah, you and, were you were in it really early, man. You, you're, yeah, you're, it was yeah. an interesting time because, uh, you know, Tracy Barnes was actually, believe it or not, he was the first internet radio station, hard radio. Wow. He pioneered it. I'm the first legit one that was through yeah. ASCAP and BMI and all that. And he had all these, you know, this is, you know, before the dot-com bust you yeah. know, happened, but everyone was after him and he had all this, you know, and it was going to be like the, the big thing Then you know, this was obviously way before Spotify and Pandora and before the streaming stuff and internet radio was just in its, its foundation. So it was kind of exciting, but nothing ever came with it. He had some offers that he never jumped on. And then by the time Napster came around, it just killed everything when, you know, and yeah. it was a shame because it would have, you know, I would have probably been a pretty wealthy man if that, uh, <laughs> you know, Oh, would, come on. A, a famous director and writer like you, and you're not living in a mansion in, in San Jose nah, right this, now. This is it. My bedroom <laughs> with my, uh, it's a metal poster, but Hey, I enjoy it. Like I said, I, dude, I, you know, I was, I'm involved with some pretty big bands and I rented an apartment too. So I believe me, I can relate that the music yeah. industry is like some people have the, you know, get lucky and other ones work their whole life and, here we are, you know. Hey, as long as you enjoy it, that's, that's yeah. I do. I, I I started my podcast in 2019, and I'm like, uh, 
119 episodes now. So oh, I'm really wow. You're way ahead of me. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Matoya was on not too long ago. Man. Oh, I love Bill. To- he's he's another guy. He's another legendary guy that's been around since the beginning and just fantastic producer, worked with so many great artists. And I feel I feel lucky because I feel like you know just about as much about the LA metal scene as anyone. But then again, you know, there's Brian Slagle, John Sutherland, oh, yeah. uh, you know, those guys, you know, Bill Matoya, they all were there at the beginning with you. So what was that like, man, when everything started happening in LA, you know, I know you documented it all, but tell my listeners about the beginning, what that was like. It was, must've been exciting. I got there in 84. So I, Okay. wasn't there at the beginning of it well you were there and when, when it was just starting to bubble up during the whole green world era when the independent you know music scene was happening i, I you know i like to say a lot of it was was uh influenced by uh england and what was happening there with the new wave of british heavy yes. metal you had kerrang and that's what influenced obviously you know the brian slagles to start a fanzine and ron quintana's and myself and and john stranansky and that really you know we were all hugely into the new wave of British heavy metal, the underground stuff. That's when Motorhead was just starting to get traction here in the States. Of course, Iron Maiden, you know, Saxon, Samson, Angel Witch, Tigers of Pantang, you know, Def Leppard already was starting to break. So it was just real exciting. And then it kind of got into the whole LA scene. And then, you know, as you mentioned, Motley Crue were kind of the big LA band that was starting to break locally. And we used to go see them in the clubs. I was, you know, I was, a little bit too young to hit the the Starwood. Uh, yeah, remember my first documentary, the Pioneers of LA Hard yeah, Rock. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Deep into that, and I was, you know, just hearing all those stories and interviewing those guys. I was like, wow, I was just that was just before my era. So, you know, I saw a lot of those bands. You know, the Snow and and you know Smile and of course Motley Crue. And I never saw Quiet Riot with Rhodes, but I, I did see them. I think with. Um, Greg Leon, I think that was when they were called the Bro. But I did have a chance to see all those early bands back then. Rat in their earliest formations, you know, playing the clubs. Metallica's very first show at Radio City I was at, and I saw all their shows in Orange County. They did a lot. I mean, it was kind of cool in Orange County. I, I grew up. People that don't know, Orange County is about an hour south of LA, mm-hmm. and it was you know you had three clubs. You had you might remember the Woodstock, Radio City. And the concert factory and the concert factory used to be the cuckoo's nest, which was like the punk rock Mecca. That was right. Like, oh, yeah. Know, the hub of punk rock music yeah. back in the day. And then uh, I think in like 81, it changed over to the concert factory. And, you know, they were getting all the L.A. bands that were, you know, you know, the Wasp, Farmer Saint. And, you know, and, and you know, so between that and the Woodstock and all that, I w- all the L.A. bands would come over. And then you had the Orange County bands. You know, I was real close with August Redmond, of course, Dante Fox, who turned into Great White. They were a huge Orange County band. Max Havoc, you know, Leather Wolf were just starting out. They were Leather Wolf. Of a band. I got so, to work with them a little bit. Yeah. So it was exciting because, you know, uh, every night there was something going on, either in Orange County, you had the Golden Bear out there too. And uh, and then you had all the candy, when, once Candy C started, yeah, all the Candy C nights, but that was a little bit later. But yeah, you know, you remember the country club. I mean, the country oh, I, club. <laughs> I spent place. many nights at the country club. I would drive from Orange County over an hour just to go Reseda. up there and drive <laughs> home at three in the morning. And oh man, they, I mean, and they, you know, they had all the national bands that would come over, Loudness and, you know, uh, Queensryche and uh, King da- or uh, Merciful Fate and Excited yeah. there and all those, you know, and then you had, you know, Armored Saint, Malice and Motorhead and uh, of course Metallica, you know, Metallica and Armored Saint played many shows there together and that, that was a great play. The Troubadour in the early days, this was before the Whiskey and Roxy were really doing a lot of metal stuff. It was all the Troubadour and the, the Country Club and uh, Troubadour was great. We used to go see Armored Saint there all the time. Wasp when they were like you know, the whole place would be on fire practically. You know, uh, De- Debbie Rogers, I know you know Debbie and uh, Jennifer, they were yeah. both working at Green World. They bugged me for months to go to see Poison. And I finally went to the Troubadour one night and I saw them right. and they were just, they were, every label was passing on them. I had that first demo yeah. and I went back to the Heinz and everyone and I said, we have to sign this band. They're like, <laughs> unbelievable. You know, the crowd just got me. It was like, 
there were 200 people there and 175 of them were women. And I'm like, yeah. if we don't sign this band, we're crazy. Okay. Exactly. Right there. There's a cell. You that know, was one well, of my first shows I saw at the Troubadour actually. And I went to the Roxy a lot after that. And that was a great that. club. It's still there too, right? It's still there. I think Golden Boys, I don't know if they own it or they, they're exclusive. So I think they just do their own shows there, their own showcases. So it's, it's not really open to the public, but then again, and nothing, I mean, none of the clubs, you know, the, the whiskey's barely staying open, you know. There's yeah, just, the whiskey went there a lot, too. Music anymore. I mean, back in the day, as you know, any night of the week, these clubs would be packed, you know. That was yeah, it did, you're right. It didn't really matter back yeah. then, you know. When you get older, you're like, oh, I don't want to go out during the week. But back then, you had to go out every oh, night yeah. of the week to see shows. Um, and, yeah. Go ahead. Oh, I was going to say, but, you know, what you were saying, like about Poison and stuff back then, the bands worked it. They worked hard. I mean, it was, you know, a lot of people think, oh, these bands just, you know, they hit on MTV and they're just these instant, you know, but, uh, no. you know, if you go back to the documentary I did, you talk about, you know, Motley Crue and their their beginnings, you know, Nicky Six had London, he was touring, playing with them, you know, Tommy Lee and Joey Vera had a band with Greg Leon before that, so they were all, you know, da Dawkin, you know, jo uh, George was an exciter, if you remember the exciter. Oh, yeah, of course uh, I do. You know, Airborne was Don's band, so they all were playing around since the 70s, and, you know, of course, Poison came from back east, but I remember yeah. when they came out, and it was like, who, who the fuck are these guys? They come out of nowhere and you just see their name everywhere all over L.A. You're walking around and there's flyers and it's like, you know, these bands, you know, whether you like them or not, you got to give them credit. They really Yeah, there was it was a I never thought I would be in, into the hair metal thing. Yeah. Poison, you know, it was just a, a, a luck. I was in the right place at the right time. That's what I, that's what I'm going to say about that. I remember you would go to a show and you go go to your car and there'd be about 50 flyers stuck into your yeah. <laughs> It was, everyone would be standing on every corner handing out flyers man on the, on the sunset boulevard you know i mean the strip and then the um rock and roll hyatt you know there'd be parties oh, there yeah. all the time you go there and party um i love the um the two la metal scene explodes documentary i'm not just saying that because my voice is in both of them i do have to ask you your version of this story, because I got to tell you, I was really shocked when you guys got in touch with me and said, can we use your voice on this? And I'm like, what are they talking about? <laughs> Did, what, what's this? I mean, Carl found the tape or yeah. something? Yeah, Carl, you know, Carl Alvarez, for people that don't know, he is my producer on those uh, uh, Inside Metal LA projects. And he is like this avid collector of everything. And you know, we, we saw that there was a hole and see, we, you know, when it came to, it, it was a trick, as you know, on that, uh, the LA metal scenes explodes, which was the second installment, which went roughly from 81 to 86. Um, there were so many bands in there. Yeah. I mean, so oh yeah. Stuff, but there was kind of that hole. We didn't want to get into the, the poison warrant guns and roses era. That was a little after. And it's like, you know, that was covered by VH1. Everyone knows that. We kind of wanted to do a little bit more on the underground and that kind of stuff. So, uh, but, you know, Carl's going, you know, there's a hole here about, you know, uh, Poison and Guns N' Roses and how they, when they were local bands, how uh, they made such an impact. And I said, well, we don't have them. We're not interviewing them. We never, you know, we, we never planned on interviewing them. And he goes, well, he came up with this tape. He goes, you know, Steve Ricardo has uh, uh, this. I think there was a little thing where you talked about Eden as well. And yeah. uh, there was a Guns N' Roses interview that he had, their very first interview ever on. They were all on Craig Williams' show or Lady Die on. Uh, Lady Die was the yeah. show I was on. Yeah, yeah. The, uh, when the, I heard that, I was like, yeah. I can't even remember. I didn't even remember. I talked about Striper, Eden, Leather, Leather Wolf, Poison. Yeah. I'm like, I was a kid, man, when I did that. I don't even know why they asked me to go on KNAC. But you yeah. know what? I was really proud and honored to be in your documentaries. Thank you. That was great. Yeah. And that was a great, I mean, that really tied everything together there because you talked about these bands and how they impacted, you know, the local scene. And then they got onto radio from a local band. And, you know, KNAC was so supportive. Of oh, the yeah, they were great. And that's, 
you know, I, you know, I don't, we're not getting into the current stuff, but today you just don't have that with the local, with local radio. They're not supporting new artists. And that's why, you know, it's all just classic rock radio. They're just playing the old songs by the old, they won't even play new songs by the old classic rock bands. I mean, if you look crazy. really close up at the upper right hand corner of, you'll see a picture of a woman that's Ton Mastery. Oh, wow. Yes. Oh, <laughs> she was a I really good that. friend of mine. Rest in peace. You know, she was the and best. She actually yeah. one night, this is a funny story. She was with this manager, Johnny Teagard. And I don't know if you remember her. She came to my house and picked me up to go to a show. And there was this other guy in the back seat that I got to listen to from the South Bay all the way to uh, the country club. And his name was Axel Rose. That was the night wow. I met him. We <laughs> rode together to the club and all he did the whole time was tell me he was going to be a big star. And he was like so confident in himself. And I get out of the car and I'm like, Tyne, who the fuck is this guy that's talking my ear? But she goes, everything he said is going to happen. And lo and behold, it did happen. Yep. Ton was like really into the she early. Knew, she, she should have been an A&R back in the day. Yeah. She knew everything that was going on. She had uh, her, her hands in, in all the local stuff. I mean, she was so supportive to Eden and all, so many local bands. You know, she would go out to, you know, the nights at Jezebel's do her thing. You oh, know, yeah, Jezebel's. Uh, different, you know, di you know, places yeah. in LA, Orange County, travel all over. She was really a part of the scene. It wasn't just a paycheck for her. She really lived that scene. She loved it. She was a real rock and roller. She was like a rock star, man. She was. You know? yeah. um, you, did, you ended up doing a, uh, you've done four documentaries and you're working on a fifth? Yeah, well, we did. We did. Uh, we did the fourth one for the Inside Metal series, which is uh, Bay Area Godfathers. Okay, uh, it's actually not under the title Inside Metal, but it's part of that series. Band vs. Brand is Band vs. Brand yeah. is a fifth one. Yeah, that was okay. one I did with Cleopatra. That was separate, and that was a really fun documentary to do. And that was a little bit different. That was on the music business side, so it's kind of different yeah. for me and about how important branding is you know, especially in this day and age for artists, and, Oh yeah. you know, owning the name and uh, uh, the likeness and, you know, the logo and, and everything that goes with it, uh, how important that is. And, you know, we interview a lot of key people uh, regarding that. And that's done really well. I'm, I'm, I'm really quite proud of that. It was, you know, it wasn't this big budget movie, but it was, uh, uh, it was, it was a really good movie. And people seem to really like that one. And I'm actually working on a new one now with Cleopatra, I can't really say much at, at, at the moment because we're still kind of working on stuff, but it'll have to do more, more with classic rock and guitar players. So oh, uh, nice. it should be a lot of fun. So um, yeah, the Inside Metal series, I don't know if we'll carry on with that. We did the Bay Area Godfathers, uh, part one and part two. Each of the Inside Metals has, as you know, has two DVDs, two movies. Part two of Bay Area Godfathers, hopefully we'll be going to streaming real soon. We had a little bit of... Uh, technical issues for part two but it is they are both out on dvd and a uh, part one is streaming on amazon prime and, and uh, you know itunes and all that uh i don't know about the future of, of the inside metal there you know the, the next obvious one would be new york but it's it's a, it's a lot of work it's uh you know the expense of new york and now with the pandemic and everything going on with travel and all it's going to be a little bit more difficult so you know, we'll see what happens there. I don't know uh, where, where we're going to take that. But, um, you know, I'm yeah, This hopefully this new movie with Cleopatra will go well. I'm, I'm really looking forward to this. Well, you, you've done a great job, man. I'm, I'm a huge Thank fan you. of your work, you know. Thank I mean, uh, I wanted to ask you, I was just curious, are you like up on new bands? Do you listen to a lot of new music now? Or are you like like a lot of people our age kind of stuck in the past a lot or yeah or... i mean I, I try to be and usually i'll get turned on you know through through people you know uh, about some new artists and stuff um so i do try to keep up with it uh although i think you know as you know being our age we've heard everything and seen everything so it's really hard to get that impact of uh you know, because everything's kind of been done. There's not a lot of bands doing something really original. I, I, I don't, I don't see these days. No. Uh, if there is, you know, send it to me. I'd love to hear it. But there's definitely some good talent out there. You know, people that say rock is dead. You know, there's, there's definitely some bands out there, hardworking bands, 
uh, going at it. And, you know, I try to support them as much as I can, but I just can't keep up with, with what's going on. And the way music is being promoted these days, it's like, I'm not an internet guy. I'm not on YouTube or on social media a lot. So I don't keep up with what's going on with this stuff. And that's you, you, how things are run these days. You mentioned John Bush and Joey Vera uh, earlier. They, they, you know, have a new record, a recent yes. record. I talked to Bill about that. You've been friends with those guys for a long time, haven't you? Since, uh, since they started, since their first show, I always uh, tease Joey. I saw them before Joey Vera was in the band. <laughs> <laughs> uh, they did a few shows with a different bass player i believe his name was mike williams and they uh did a show at woodstock and i must have been you know 16 or 17 at the time uh i saw them there 17 and uh yeah blown away that was like in there when they very first started out yeah it's really great to see that people, are, they're finally getting the recognition. It took a long time for that band to really get recognized as one of the real pioneers of that early scene. People didn't know that Metallica opened up for them and things oh, like yeah. that. No one ever knew that. But now it's like it's becoming more and more known. And I'm really happy for those guys, man. They've, they've always been hard workers, you know? Absolutely. And greatest bunch of guys. And I think now since they've been on Metal Blade, I think now they're almost bigger than they were back in the 80s. Yeah, you know, that's what I mean. Time. Yeah, they've really yeah. gotten huge, for Absolutely. sure. Yeah. So, I mean, are there a lot of other bands from the er that era that you're still in touch with now that you're friends with? Because you knew everybody. Yeah, Bob. well, that was a great <laughs> thing about the documentary is reconnecting with a lot of these bands. Because a lot of these bands, they remember me from the Headbanger. When I would do like an L.A. you know, metal special and we would have, you know, like Malice and, and Sound Barrier and Black and Blue and Ron Keel's old man, Steeler. Oh, and, I remember you know, Steeler, man. Wow. Oh, yeah. And Rat. And so when I met with all these guys, they're like, oh, shit, Bob, man, 30 years. <laughs> what the fuck? You know, so uh, it was fun kind of reconnecting. And, and I just love the fact that these guys are still together and still producing music. And, um, you know, and that's the thing I, I really love, you know, again, like, you know, I, 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 you know, people go, oh, you direct all these movies, you must have a lot of money. No, it's not a big money making <laughs> thing, but it was just the fun. It was just great to relive that and to really support that because um, it was, as you know, such a great scene. And a lot of these bands, you know, that we covered in these L.A. Uh, metal documentaries, we didn't just go for the big popular, you know, you know, platinum. Right. Bands. We want to touch on the bands that were huge during that era. So, you know, like I say, Leather Wolf, you know, and they ruled Orange County back then. Uh, Pandemonium, all yeah. these bands. I was going to mention them. They came, they came down from Alaska, man. They were, yeah. And they were <laughs> yeah, like you... ruling the scene for a while. A lot right. of these bands were, you know. So, uh, you know, they never really made it to, to the next level. But, you know, we wanted to really bring the listener or the viewer back to 1984, 85, when that scene was you know happened. i miss those days man i yeah. miss those days hey Good bob time. thanks a lot man for taking the time to talk to me man i really appreciate it oh absolutely steve and like you say we're you know you go way back and you've done so much for the metal scene working you know with, with restless and of course uh roadrunner and AM and all the uh uh, other stuff you've done and you're still doing it and you know it's funny people like see you know i'm you know just turned 57 and it's just like you know i'm uh, whoa aren't you gonna you know stop are you still doing the you know i enjoy it it's fun it's cool as long as it's fun and it's cool you know you're never too old to rock and roll right Bob? absolutely hey if mick jagger could do it so could we right? <laughs> hey thanks a lot dude and i wish you the best of luck with your future projects man i'll I be looking out it. for all of them man thank you so much steve we'll keep thanks, in touch dude.